Check, check, there we are. Okay, so wow. <laughs> I saw this on my computer, but it's a completely different feeling when you see that, right? Yeah, and it's. <laughs> to see yourself. So I, um, we had an earlier conversation, and I wanted to narrow down this huge uh, topic to make this conversation actually um, useful to the audience because we have little time, obviously. Um, and what emerged as the most important thing to you is th these new forms of communication that are a direct next step after the way we've changed our communications with digital technologies, with the internet and social networks. And we all know that all our data is now owned by someone, somewhere, everything. So how does it now shift when you're talking about genetics and DNA? And this is really what you're asking about. What is the relationship difference? How, how are our relationship changing once we're looking at each other through these other prisms that are on a biological level, right? So why don't we start opening that up and um, who wants to take it on, Soraya or <laughs> Sri? Okay. Why don't, you, why don't you comment and then we can pass it on to Sri. Um, okay, yeah, there we are. So, yeah, technology isn't always so smooth. <laughs> it uh, leads to a lot of things that we don't expect. <laughs> Thank you. The evenings flow so far. Um, yeah, basically, I have been thinking about the, the kind of continuation. So if you think about the digital technologies that we are kind of accustomed to thinking about the impact of them on our social lives and our relationships and intimacy and thinking about social media and thinking about commodification of our data and social media and kind of the exploitation and an extraction of our information from that. So I'm kind of taking this next step and thinking about what does desire and intimacy look like in a biotech future that's actually maybe not really the future but maybe it's already here. Um, and, and thinking also a bit about what are some of the vulnerabilities and risks and exploitative practices that are already uh, very widespread in biotechnology and medicine and uh, drawing on that and trying to weave the two things together. So trying to make a narrative that's both about um, a very personal story but also about a very political story. Sure. Um. So thank you for coming. This was um, really, I, I watched the movie uh, yesterday. Um, so I'm, I'm a scientist I'm in the chemistry and biochemistry department, but mostly work on uh, issues in genetics and genetic engineering. Um, I am a big believer that the technologies around genetics have been moving at an incredibly fast pace. I think we were just talking about an analogy that I often use is there's a, there's a law called Moore's Law that Gordon Moore, who was the head of Intel, first described where the, the general thought was that ev every 18 months we were seeing a, a doubling in the number of transistors in a normal microchip. And this had consequences towards the pace uh, of the technologies around the computing revolution. Um, and, and, it, and sometimes you don't realize what's happened over the last decade in, in things like genetic sequencing or editing or, or even DNA synthesis. And um, so if you just compare sequencing, uh, over about a five year period, we have about 35 years of Moore's Law progress. So thinking of that from in just real terms, it's a programmer in 1980, suddenly five years later having today's computer. So that's a massive technological change and I think we're just starting to come to grips with it and I think it's gonna get a lot harder uh, so I think conversations like these and films like these are really important to start those conversations uh, because it's it's an interesting world right now. Uh, and I think it's going to get uh, more interesting in the, in the coming years. Because I, I don't think this pace is stopping anytime soon. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so the reason why I didn't want to speak straight away, because the point I'm actually interested and found intriguing in the film is how you, you are in this technical world and the saliva sample and, you know, the DNA um, information and all the data stuff and analysis. But then there is actually, you know, you are there as a real person and you, you know, you're actually very curious to see and get responses and possibly also meet this person and you drive to where this person has gone around and so on. So, I, I, I've, you know, for me, this physical, real, bodily world is, is still, uh, is very present, right? It hasn't disappeared and it actually drives the story. And so that's, uh, it's that relationship that I find really interesting. And um, so you don't, you know, I'm actually intriguing, the film has the, the title of the film is your number, right? Not the donor number. It's, it's my donor number. Yeah, which is a little confusing, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure it's it intentional. Well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I would be interested to to um, to hear maybe what you think about this sort of how do, how would you call it the normal life world? I mean normal. What's normal here? But, I mean, of course this is going to change, right? But I don't think it's completely disappearing. And in the film, for me, it's very strong. Mm -hmm. Because you're actually, as a physical person, very much in the center of what's going on. Yeah, so I think of that a bit as this kind of missing body problem in most of digital um, technology and discussion around surveillance in particular, that there's all of this discussion about data and that we completely forget that people have physical bodies and that data comes from this messy thing, this messy like, physical, biological entity. And so in my work for the past six years, at least, I've been trying to uh, gear our attention back to actually paying attention to the fact that we are bodies, that we have a physical presence, and it isn't just a virtual existence. So I think that's very much part of what I'm trying to do. And, um, and thinking also about all of the messiness that comes from being this body and, and how attractive that is and how, um, how much that's connected with desire and, and intimacy, um, even if it goes through a mediated form. So we're, we've thought, you know, in, there's a lot of um, popular culture and uh, films and TV shows and so forth that have us think about falling in love with someone you know, uh, that might be uh, a representation or, or so on, right? A kind of digital self or a, or a bot or whatever. Um, but thinking about how you can fall in love with someone through their cells is, is another thing. Um, and I don't know if there's any biologists in the room, but uh, part of the story came to me through really going through this act of cell culture and realizing that the, the act of actually growing mammalian cells is so full of care, and that it's really this process of washing cells and feeding them and keeping them warm and putting so much labor into keeping these things alive and finding that, um, I mean, if you imagine that it's this one person who you're keeping alive in this petri dish, and that's really uh, an incredibly intimate act. Having said that, why don't we turn back and just um, asking Sri actually directly, what happens when I put my data into 23andMe? Who owns it? What happens? Um, I'm not a lawyer, but my uh, my wife is, and um, she did not let me put my information on 23andMe. Um, but um, so 23andMe owns it. I think that's pretty explicit in 23andMe. Um, they don't guarantee you in, in any real way that that data will remain private. In fact, they, I think they're pretty explicit. They use that data for all sorts of purposes, including monetizing it for uh, research and development. So um, what they're providing you is a service where they um, take your DNA, uh, sequence what are known as SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, so places where uh, all of us in the room, so every human genome, there's like a 
say, a reference human genome, might differ, uh, usually differs around 5 million sites. 99% um, of those sites are what are known as common SNPs. So those, these, these mutations have existed likely before, most of them existed likely before the expansion of humans out of Africa. So these have been kind of distributed across all the world, and, um, uh, and you have a collection of these SNPs, and they're one or one of the four bases, or one of the two or three alleles at that, those particular positions. They have um, a technology that um, they actually just use, outsource a technology that lets them uh, like assay those, I think, 23 me uses 600,000, I think you said in the film, but it's on that order. Today's stuff is usually on the order of a million or so individual single nucleotide poly polymorphisms that they just check. And this gives us a way to look at history uh, of essentially the basics, genetics of how those common traits uh, have been, uh, how, how common traits, or common SNPs in general, uh, the, the set of ones that you inherited. And that has certain implications for the types of genetic traits uh, that you might have. Um, who owns it? I, I think it's pretty explicit that it's 23andMe, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, Um, that there's a lot of reasons why um, people use these services uh, beyond just for fun also. I mean, um, so a lot of people who are adoptees looking for their family, also thinking of African Americans in the United States who've had their history taken from them, had their ancestry taken from them, use these services to try to gain access to family and to ancestry and to really connect. So there's a deep and troubling thing there when thinking of how people are trying to really connect with family and find their histories, uh, find their roots, and that that's then exploited by um, companies for profits and sold in, in ways that are really not clear, I think. I mean, the kind of consent that you go through in these processes, it varies between the companies, but it's, it's not a, a clear and transparent thing. And so what happened with the Golden State Killer case, which is um, probably something most people in the room are familiar with, um, is that basically a serial killer, or there was a kind of cold case um, and a suspect was arrested based on their relatedness to someone who had put their DNA profile in a publicly accessible genetic website, basically. So a kind of social network for, um, for DNA. And the police appropriated that, so they basically used that public database and um, submitted their own sample, submitted the sample from the crime scene and found a close enough match to start to trace uh, a, a sort of um, handful of likely candidates for who that might be. And I don't know if you want to add to that. Uh, other than they just took the DNA, they followed a number of people and took DNA samples from all of them, from discarded, like kind of from your previous work, like cigarette butts or drinks. So how do you find 
And so um, it shows, I think, in a really pivotal way how much caution we really should take when we use these services and how much caution we should take with our data and that we might well be opting into these um, kind of quasi-police databases without really giving it the kind of thought that it needs. The, one thing, the other thing I'll add there is that was the first case, it was a big piece of news, it was a big killer. I, I, um, when did that happen? Late, late or Beginning of this year, maybe. Um, there's been 12 new murders solved since then. So this is now increasing exponentially in, in terms of, um, especially in old murder cases, but there's no real law or any real court cases around where that ends and begins in terms of what you're allowed to use those databases for. Isn't there a work you did that was responding to this? Something that sprayed DNA? Did you do this? Mm -hmm. Yes, tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Um, yes, so in 2014, so after working with the strangers' DNA samples, I uh, worked on a project called Invisible, where I made a kit uh, for erasing and replacing your DNA in public. So thinking about uh, basically how would you protect yourself from me, or at least that's what I thought at the time. Um, so basically, it's two sprays, so erase is bleach and water, which is very good for wiping away DNA, but you can't spray bleach on everything, and so uh, the uh, replace spray is a kind of DNA obfuscation spray, and so that's 50 different sources of DNA combined together with a preservative that keeps it particularly uh, stable at room temperature. And so, yes, the idea was, there were several ideas there, but um, one of them was to kind of question the authority of DNA evidence. So to say if it's so easy to hack and forge and spoof and cover this up, should we really see it as this gold standard that we tend to see it as? And the protocols for making invisible are totally open source. You can find them on my website. You can make your own invisible at home. So Soraya, what do you think? How much can we tell from a DNA sample? I would be rather skeptical, but I was surprised. I mean, I haven't done 23 Me, I confess, and I'm not, yeah, I'm asked this question often. I'm not tempted, but I get more and more arguments why I should not do it. I'm not curious in finding all these things um, about health risk and so on. But um, so I was surprised what they supposedly tell you, right? I mean, that how you sleep in the night and this, uh, you know, these behavioral things. Is that true? I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm completely surprised, right? So I would have thought that you know, not everything is in the. So my my critical stance would be, you know, it's actually you can't get so much out of the DNA, as it it just doesn't define us, right? Um, um, but maybe you are also saying, right, that this argument may not be hold for for very much longer. I'm not so sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, I agree that DNA does not tell everything. <laughs> I think it's really important to be clear that, um, I mean, part of what I'm trying to do in this project is show this uh, reading into and projecting onto data um, so that this is much like any kind of um, relationship or grappling with ambiguity or any kind of subjective act where you're projecting what you want and projecting your desires onto that uh, subject. and. So I've done other work as well that showed uh, more directly the kind of limitations of the interpretation. So I worked on a project called Probably Chelsea uh, where I created 30 different interpretations of Chelsea Manning's DNA from the same DNA sample. So that showed this kind of space of possibility of how many different ways and how really different these faces could look based on interpreting exactly the same data, but, um, but kind of showing the probability space of that. So if you imagine that you would have like a 60% chance of having blue eyes and 30% uh, chance of brown eyes and 10% chance of green eyes, then you can really show that in a physical space, the different kind of probabilities there. Um, and so that's what that, that project tried to open up. And when it comes to behavioral things, I mean, it's even more um, subjective, I would say, and uh, governed by nature and environment and the rest of it. Because um, for the ancestry tests, right? So, you know, there's a group of people who, you know, 
comment on this and actually comment very critically on this. And so I have noticed that the arguments have shifted. So initially, let's say when this started, just a little less than maybe 10 years ago, the argument was the science is not good, right? It can't tell you from where in Africa you're from. It started actually with some. Um, and this is, just, this is just bogus, right? I mean, they just pretend, right? But then now that the databases grow, right? Because m the more people do it, the better this uh, perspective um, actually become. Now the argument has changed, right? And it has changed to the, but we are not our DNA, right? So it's, it's so, you know, even if, you know, we can find out maybe, right, where in Africa you come from, it's still, I think, very iffy. Um, then, uh, be, um, then it still doesn't tell you who you are, right? So, but it's a different kind of argument. It's a shift. Uh, with the development of the but science. It lends itself to so much manipulation, and if we follow what she was talking about in relation to Moore's law, in relation to lack of knowledge or lack of even care, you know, where you're just clicking yes, 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 and the next thing you know, who knows what's going on. So, Sri, Sh how do you feel? Do you think that in five years, and how do you, I'm sorry, another sub-question is, how do you know that a lot of implicit bias may be going into all these databases that are already in digital databases and just kind of get transferred into bio, right? Um, it seems kind of hopeless. It's like climate change. We all know, but nobody's doing anything. Red flags have been going on. In fact, it seems like it's been going in parallel, the genetic engineering and climate change and Nobody is paying attention, but it seems to be what our new century is bringing along. So, is it all dark? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, I here's what I'll, I'll, I'll say. Um, I think what you guys are saying is totally right. That everyone just projects their biases onto these data sets, and you can you can make any story that you really want um, right now. I think there's a lot coming that's going to be changing that and, and to some extent, but not, but my guess is it's always going to be that, that people, I mean, just like vaccines, GMOs, climate change, like there's, there's, there's different amounts of set science and no one cares, right? It's really where the lens that you're coming from and, and you can use whatever you want to go do that, right? So. Even if the science is settled, I think the problem is like has to do with us communicating. Uh, so maybe I'll leave it at there instead of talking about all the science. Um, but if people are interested, maybe we can talk about it in questions. Maybe we can open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a small comment, which is that I think in terms of what you're saying about this shift, um, I think we have to be really cautious around the kind of market, the marketing claims of biotechnology. Um, so it might claim to connect you to your ancestors um, and I think it's important that we look at what is actually what the science is actually doing and also who it's doing work for um, and who's profiting from that work um, so I think that there's a lot that gets glossed over and simplified and reduced um, in in the in the marketing of these kinds of um, products All right, so we're going to open it up to you. Or did you want to say something? Oh, Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> Just that if people have questions, they can come up here to ask so that you guys all have a chance to, to respond. <laughs> uh, yeah, is that intimidating? <laughs> Oh, perfect. Okay, so, so good, good. Let's do that. Okay, so Chella will pass the microphone. Um, so I'm curious, uh, since you grew the cells of this uh, saliva donor, did you end up growing your own, and you know, what were your reflections on it if you did? I did, yeah. So I did a number of different experiments growing different saliva cells, um, I mean, so cheek cells from saliva. 
Um, the interesting thing actually was how variable it was in terms of how well they did in the media and how well they um, survived and, and grew. So that was the thing that was interesting to me, that some, some of the subjects' cells would really proliferate uh, very quickly and others would just die off immediately. And then mine were just kind of somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Such a nice, nice ritual. Um, uh, Heather, did you ever feel like you were starting to approach some sort of personal ethical boundary and that you had to step back at any point or did you just keep going? That's a very good question. Um, so the whole thing is really grappling with this ethical boundary. Um, so this project for me it describes and it's, it's a way of showing the ethical grappling that I've been doing over the last six years with my work and how, how conflicted I really feel about it all. Um, in this project in particular, I started really going down this route of thinking, um, I'm researching biological commodification. I didn't get totally into that in the slides, but it started as a real kind of research project trying to map out all of the terrain of um, the commodification of biomaterials. And then I realized that that was just too large for one project because it was filling my whole wall. <laughs> and so that I needed to take kind of one route through that material. And um, that's what led me to buy this one saliva sample. I mean, I didn't have funding at the time really and I was just kind of figuring out what I was doing. But I thought, well, why not just see what I could find with this one sample. And that led me to a place ultimately where I did feel um, uncomfortable proceeding as a kind of straightforward um, documentary or exploit or whatever you'd want to call it project. And, and simultaneously it kind of crossed with a lot of other personal things in my life and kind of, you know, the wires got crossed a bit. And, and it also um, overlapped with working with Chelsea Manning's DNA and that was also a process where I kind of paused and then looked back and realized that that had been this, this strange emotional and personal experience where I worked with this person's DNA and data before I met them, that I knew them in this weird way through their DNA before ever exchanging a message with them even and um, that there was something significant to that and so I was, basically trying to, to write through these things and um, weave them together. But really the whole thing is about highlighting my um, vulnerabilities and how much I struggle with the material that I work with. I have the microphone. Since I'm not standing up, there's no way to otherwise identify myself. Um, thank you so much for um, the presentation of your work, Heather, and this conversation uh, tonight. It's really um, deeply fascinating. Um, I have two questions for which I apologize. I know that's bad practice. Um, the first is uh, for uh, Shri. Um, in the early part of the conversation, you referenced Moore's Law, and I know at that moment in the conversation you were using it as a kind of general analogy. Um, it's interesting in this context because it's such a specific function. It's something, right, like the doubling of the number of transistors on a circuit of fixed area or something like that, Moore's Law. Um, I'm curious in the context of this conversation, the scientific context, um, whether there are such specific functions that seem especially relevant to this conversation um, and that might function as such a kind of um, profoundly structuring rule um, in this body of research, this area of research, in this sort of market. Um, so that's the first question, and then there's a second, which is to the panel. So I'll, I'll pause there first. Well, uh, I guess in sequencing, it's, it's, it's always been just a cost per base of sequencing, and that's kind of the, the, the 35 years of Moore's Law that I was referring to. I think the question you're asking is a lot more profound, which is, is there a similar type of law towards knowledge in genetics? Um, 
probably answer is no, but I, I think there's a number of metrics that are interesting. Um, one, uh, so, and this might come up later, so I might as well just explain it now. So there, there's, um, there's really like, if you think about genetics and how its implications in disease, um, and disease is one manifestation of what we call traits, which are just a, a way to like, what, what's the manifestation of something you, that we all think about, like height, weight, but also things like um, various disease states. But if we think about it from disease, um, there's three major classes of disease where genetics plays a role other than infectious disease. First one is um, rare disease. So rare diseases are largely caused by individual mutations that have very large effect, and that mutation is causal for that disease. And so these are all the like syndromes that you've heard. So there's thousands of them, literally, and, and these are usually just one gene either getting knocked out or something's happened to that gene. Um, so things like microcephaly or uh, uh, muscular dystrophy or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So like, these are rare diseases, single mutations, cause the disease, you inherit it by, from your parents. Um, uh, so that's one class, and we've made a ton of progress there. So since the human genome has been sequenced, you know, we probably, and these are called also Mendelian diseases because they segregate like, I don't know if you ever did genetics in high school where you have those like family trees and you color inside, you know, that th those are Mendelian diseases and they're largely rare diseases and they're largely due to the mutation of the single gene. Um, there are something, and um, I might get these numbers wrong, but I think on order, something like several thousand Mendelian diseases. And I think we're north of like 60 to 70% of them have been identified. Um, so, and that's getting just better and better because of sequencing. So rare diseases, usually rare, large effect mutations. Second class is like somatic diseases arising during the course of your life. So cancer, it's a big one there. Um, third set of things are what basically every disease you've ever heard of, when you might know family members that have, are complex diseases. And these are complex, they're called complex because the genetic etiology is that it's not a single mutation that leads to the disease, it's this accumulation of these common SNPs and perhaps some rare SNPs um, that lead you to have some genetic susceptibility to the strain. So this is everything from like neuropsychiatric diseases, obesity, height, weight, some people might say intelligence. Um, so that's, those are all complex. And um, there, there's, it's harder, what is the progress and what is, you know, and, and we know that environmental factors play a big role. So it, it's harder to have metrics there. I think in cancer and in rare disease, it, we're making a ton of progress. I think in this complex area, which I think is kind of a lot of where the murky issues come in, um, I don't know if there's good metrics. I don't, yeah. One of the things that was interesting, um, which Soraya mentioned, is that to the extent that the accumulation of larger and larger data sets improves some of the kind of predictive power of some of these tests or the generalizing power of some of these tests, you can imagine some moment at which the field actually begins to realize um, increasing marginal productivity um, rather than a kind of constraint, which I think is, which is interesting. I think um, that's really such a nice point that you brought that up. I mean, that it's, that there's these kind of two op opposing graphs, that we have this increase in capacity, but then decrease in what we're actually finding from all of this data. Uh, and then the second question, really, for, for everyone, perhaps especially for you, Heather, and I have some sense of kind of market around consumer genetic testing, um, but I was, I was puzzled by the role that the bio solutions plays in this broader market. I'm curious, for example, about the inducements of the donors, the kind of discursive framing of that decision to donate. When I was looking at the screenshots of the online database, I was confused about who the end consumers might be because it seems like these things aren't really in batch and they're highly idiosyncratic and kind of priced at a unit basis. And so I would just love to hear more about about Lee, maybe in particular, that kind of part of the, um, the market or the, the ecosystem of this? Yeah, so that is really interesting stuff, I think. Um, <laughs> so I tried to find out as much as I could about what was going on there. And um, so Lee is, is 
um, representative of a, of a handful of companies worldwide that are doing these kinds of things. Um, and so basically Lee, so um, they, they call St. Louis the spit capital of the world because they collect so much saliva. And most of that they're isolating proteins from and sending on for other kinds of clinical um, purchases, basically. So they have relationships with clinics and they isolate these proteins and the proteins go to the clinics for tests, diagnostic tests and so forth. But clearly they also have a whole catalog of other things and they say even on the website, if there's something that we don't have that you want, let us know, we can get it. And so when I went through the process of looking into becoming a donor myself, um, I got a form from them. Actually, I asked for the consent forms. So I said, um, partially truthfully, that I was a researcher at a, a university and I needed to see the consent forms for my internal uh, institutional review board. Mm -hmm. And what they sent me back was nothing like a consent form at all, but it was a sign-up form that mm -hmm. said, what kinds of fluids would you like to donate? Mm -hmm. You know, saliva, semen, blood, menstrual blood, urine, mm -hmm. blood, you know, sweat, tears, all of it, really. Um, which was, I thought, really telling. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the consent processes that are going on here are really dubious. I think that I don't, I still wasn't able to find, so I would need a kind of investigative partner, which I was never able to obtain for this project, to find mm -hmm. out how they're recruiting people mm -hmm. and where. But the fact that um, that I how do I, how should I put that without, um, I, I think it's a local activity, so I have good reason to believe that they're recruiting people that are local, um, that can go into the lab and donate fluids frequently, they get paid to do that, um, and that's the fluid part. And then there's a whole nother part that's harvested from cadavers, and that's a whole nother conversation that, um, I mean this was part of why I felt like the map of this was too much for one project, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of harvesting of materials um, from places where people don't know that if you donate your body to science, actually it might end up just being sold by a company like Lee in bits and pieces. Um, and then there's the third line of that, which is the kind of Henrietta Lacks story, um, where your cells can be taken without your consent, without your explicit consent, and then turned into all manner of products. Um, and so, that means that when you go to the doctor and you have a biopsy or you have blood taken or whatever, that whatever is left can be used for anything and no one has to ask you. That's helpful. Thank so you. that's a fun yeah. answer. Yeah. Great. I, I may have a little follow-up question because, so you became a donor yourself and in the story that plays a role, but how did this continue, you being a donor? I mean. You could imagine someone doing the same stuff you did to this guy. So did you receive emails or, uh, I mean, how, you know, you could imagine this is a looping story. <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, so um, there are several elements of the story that I would like to leave open to interpretation. So without kind of giving away exact details about um, kind of what's fact and what's fiction. So the, the, the T3511 is a hybrid of the two. And so I think for me what was important to suggest with becoming a donor is that it was a way of connecting to this person. So by going through what they had gone through and um, inhabiting the same seat, that it was a kind of way of being close to them and then also making myself vulnerable in the same way. I just wanted to go back to the film a little bit and, and make two little comments. One was that I, f I felt the film was very poetic. If I, 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 f I came away from it and I thought it was a poem on the small screen, I have to say. On the big screen it is um, more, less than a poem maybe. But, but, but that's something that struck me and that has to do with your voice and the, your way of speaking and so on and so forth. The other, the other point about the film that struck me was th that it was... Um, that you created a, a world without community. There was just a few back views of humans when you posting this envelope, but that was all we saw of mankind or womankind. 
And so I, I, the, the, this is a way of creating a certain depressive atmosphere, but it's, of course, a constructed atmosphere in this room. I just wanted to highlight these mm -hmm. two things. Yeah, I think those are really nice observations. Yeah, yes, I have. That's the cat was there also. Um, yeah, I think that that's really. Those are really good observations. Um, and the, I think what what I was thinking of in this kind of solitude of this figure um, is also to to leave open whether any of this ever happened at all. So whether this might just be totally in this person's imagination. Was there at the end? It sounded like you, someone was sleeping, maybe. <laughs> was it? Oh, that's nice. I think it's open to interpretation. <laughs> um, I have a question for Sri. Um, I believe you s s talked before about some work you've uh, done encoding information into DNA. And I was wondering about just the materials or the materiality of what it was that you were encoding. Were you building up the DNA from scratch or were you using a one person's DNA or was it more like a burger from McDonald's where it's DNA from like you know, hundreds of people? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's chemically synthesized DNA. So it's actually, um, there's a company called Agilent Technologies that uh, actually Yaniv Elric, who was in the, um, Wait, it wasn't in your introduction. Uh, also does work in the space, but uh, he. It's so we all use this mostly this process of inkjet printing. Um, so Agilent Technologies is a spinoff of HP. So imagine instead of CMYK in your inkjet printer, you have ACTG, and it's literally the same print head. And um, and what you do is on a glass slide, you can print out like one base at a time and through. a series of chemical reactions basically build up a, a, a string of DNA. And you can do that at millions of spots on a single glass slide. Uh, what we do is just programmatically do that, encoding digital information into ACT's G's, which is sort of a digital code. It's not digital, but it's you know four uh, bases. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then that's the writing. And the reading is using kind of the modern sequencers that um, that I talked about before, so it, it's it's a, a clear like near one to one correspondence in that sense. Uh, yes. Um, so does that does that imply then that uh, um, that the things you are that you've written in DNA now in five ten years will no longer be able to be read with uh, cutting edge machines like it's like Betamax or something? <laughs> Um, maybe I don't understand the question. So what you said? Well, you, you talked about encoding it, encoding information into the into the DNA, and then it's then it gets being then it gets read by the the machines, right? The, the, computers. the computers that are being used now. So as yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, so so the information is encoded into the DNA, and the DNA should be able to read read by any sequencer that might be developed in the future because it will still be the same uh, chemical bases that make it up. However, the format of, of how that was um, turned into these base pairs, so how it moved from being you know, whatever that file is or whatever the, the source is, the content that you're then encoding into the DNA, that you can get that back into the content, that's the part uh, where you need some kind of archival process because those things change so dramatically. So if you put, you know, an image file or something in there, you have to, um, you will have to also account for being able to read that back out in the future. So, yeah, so the, the thing, thank you, I, I didn't understand the question. Um, the thing that we encoded were like books and some videos. And so like if you can't, re if you can't, if you don't know how to turn digits into a movie, like a um, an MP4 or something, then yeah, then you wouldn't be able to read it out. But you can all, you could read out the zeros and ones pretty easily. Um, <laughs> uh, you mentioned Heather a couple times this uh, fact versus fi fiction and open to interpretation. It just struck me that you said that, and then I it led me to think about this parallel. Sorry, this is more of a comment, but it's getting to a question. It made me think of this parallel. Um, about the DNA itself and the way you're talking about uh, 
how there are these probabilistic portraits. And I guess I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like why is that important to you that there's some uh, in the film some ambiguity or actually I, I didn't necessarily read that much ambiguity but why is that important to you and then maybe in your all three of you in your practice like how do you grapple with uh, this fact versus fiction or interpretation versus uh, law or theory or statement and what what does that open up for you and what does that uh, how does that limit you or challenge you I think that's a really great observation also. <laughs> I'm choking. It's very emotional. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that the what you identify um, is really exactly what I was hoping for in terms of leaving it open. So I'm hoping that the, the structure of the work leaves the space that you project onto it, these, your own kinds of um, fears and desires and interpretations of, of what DNA can and can't say and what this person might or might not do and what is ethical and what isn't. And so I'm, I was really hoping that the, the format of that do exactly that, so parallel this ambiguity that's inherent in the data, but also inherent in the process of my work, because I think um, getting at um, Kyle's question, that it is this ethically gray area, and so I'm always going through these projects and projecting, you know, my own kind of ethical framework onto them, and um, so I wanted to create this space for people to um, to project those things onto this character as well. Maybe I'll just leave it at that for now. Um, <clears throat> I really loved the film, and um, one of the, I think the thing that one of the things that struck me was how you went back and forth between emotion and materiality, in a kind of hot and cold. Uh, and I liked the way you, when you talked about um, that all DNA. I, I don't remember how you quite said it. DNA itself or DNA test a test is both a love story and a detective story. And it, it, what I was struck with is the way in which it's like any kind of ordinary love story, that you take pieces and little bits and then fill them in with all these fantasies. And that's kind of what you're unfolding here. I wasn't so clear about the detective part of it, unless I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the detective story, um, you know, that you're, you're, you're tracking as you try to fill in the blanks. But is that what you meant? Can you talk about that? Yeah, exactly. So the detective story, and I mean, in the in the film, very literally, um, this kind of investigative act of profiling this person, you know, having this semi-surreptitious sample, profiling them, analyzing it, trying to put together clues to figure out more about who they are, going on social media, um, learning about them through putting together these different uh, bits of information, basically. And so I think that's something that I've been working with for a long time. So I um, am very inspired also by detective stories. <laughs> I always really loved reading Sherlock Holmes and um, was also uh, have enjoyed many a forensic uh, show. So <laughs> that uh, this kind of detective backstory is something that I've always been really drawn to, I think. And then I started thinking about the the relationship between the detective story and the love story because I was in um, a long distance relationship and that relationship left a lot of space for projection and for uh, realizing this, realizing that I was going through this weirdly similar process of uh, piecing together bits of information and learning about this person 
um, in a way that I had done with data from DNA donors. So. bit of a follow-up to that. Um, the form is very much video art, I would say, so it could go into a gallery and be a video art piece, and yet there's traces of sci-fi that could be into a whole kind of drama movie, right? How do you see your role and just in general this booming field of bio art raising awareness effectively? I'm thinking of format, actually, because you are shifting through different media and trying different strategies. So I'm, um, in terms of like which media I choose, um, I try to choose the, the medium that will best convey what I'm working on, the ideas that I'm thinking through and the way that I'm thinking through them. So for this project, it could have gone in a, in a lot of different directions. So I had a lot of different ideas when I started doing the research. Um, probably most of them really bad. <laughs> and most of them, I mean, luckily got thrown out. And uh, basically, I just started writing as part of my research project. And so it was kind of this, I started writing these lab notebook entries. And then I was also writing these um, long letters to my uh, distant uh, relationship <laughs> and then I started thinking about the confluence of these two things and what if I mingled these things together a bit and so that led to this format which then I um, as I started writing these letters I could kind of see these images in my mind so I just it's not I haven't made other films really um, and I don't know if I would again but it felt to me like it could have this kind of cinematic existence um, in the tradition of like a Chantal Ackerman style, like a diaristic type of film. Um, what are, are there films out there that you could point to that you think are asking these questions effectively or telling stories around these questions effectively? Besides X-Men, of course. <laughs> Um, not really recently that I'm so fond of. Um, the closest thing I would say is the Black Mirror series. I did really enjoy watching that, and I think um, you know that's been widely watched, which I think is is a good thing. I think that it it thoughtfully reflects on our kind of technological imaginary right now. So that is probably the one recommendation that comes to mind. Are there positive stories here, <laughs> right? Like, I, I mean, you know, I think a lot of, I, I think it's important to bring up like some of the more dystopian themes that come about when talking about genetics, but I rarely see the opposite. And I'm just wondering, are, is there just not narrative there or is it just not obvious what the positives are or? If that's, yeah, if that's the state of it, then but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts on, like there's a flip side to this that is very positive that we often see as scientists and, and clinicians and that I think is actually very profound. I, I think some of those stories you probably know on the, the medical, like the rare disease communities coming together. Um, I don't know, I, I'm just wondering, are, are, there, are there narratives there to be told and, and how do you think about that? Yeah, I think a lot of the things actually that I'm dealing with just in the film are not necessarily negative. I mean, I think that um, pointing out that things are intimate is not a negative thing. I mean, pointing out that the things you might do in the lab every day are actually an act of, of closeness with a human, um, I don't see that as negative at all. I just see it as, uh, as an observation, sharing an observation that this is actually a very personal thing um, that's happening all the time and it laps all over the place. So I don't think that that's negative at all. I think it's really just a, a different way of seeing an incredibly common practice. And I think it's, for me at least, it's really interesting to think through different ways of being close to other people um, and different kinds of ways of, of, of feeling, and different ways of feeling desire and intimacy and so forth. Um, and so my interest actually in, in working on this project came not from a dystopic impulse so much as 
thinking through the future of um, of relationships and of of these kind of human uh, connections in this post biotech uh, moment. And I think that there are there are things there that that could be really liberating. Um, so you know, in this moment in the film, I think I think it's in the final cut. Actually, I can't remember now. But there's a moment. Um, so on 23andMe, you connect, and suddenly you um, can find all your DNA relatives. And so I remember looking at my own 23andMe profile and seeing that I would have suddenly like 7,000 new relatives. And so I think that that is actually, that's a really interesting phenomenon to think about. How does that change your idea of family and relatedness? And can that kind of radically explode the way that we think about conventional family and maybe you know make some some new connections and, and new ways of thinking about what family means. So that's kind of maybe the most positive thing that I can think of. <laughs> Shri is not convinced. <laughs> Like I was just saying, when you think one half of a part of this is like the reproductive, you know, consequences or possibilities, right? So people with like genetic diseases that normally wouldn't want to pass that on or something, or like there's so many narratives about overcoming some obstacle of like, I couldn't have this baby and now I can, that I had the flip reaction looking at those of just like, really, is it that positive or are there, <laughs> are there negatives? Just saying that the, the dominant discourse, I mean, that this is, again, this kind of marketing discourse is always totally positive and glowing and, you know, hides that there would be any dystopic thing. And so it's, it's a question, really, of, I think, sussing out what feels like it is, I mean, in terms of bringing alternate discourses to the table. We might not agree on what the dominant discourse is, um, but making other kinds of views available, I think, is the point. But um, I mean, in the medical context, in the reproductive context, it seems like you know you can do things and overcome obstacles. But I mean, we were starting off speaking about this policing kind of context and um, and surveillance kinds of concept, and you know about privacy and giving away your privacy, and so that's much more threatening, right? So um, positive, negative. I don't know which one is dominating, right? Um, they come together, probably, right? Yeah, I think that I think that marketing will take care of sharing the positive discourses, and you know, artists can kind of pick up in the holes in there and and share some of the other things, and um, yeah. There's another question there. I have another one. Um, so I was. Thinking more about the, the kind of intimacy you established with this donor in the in the film by growing their cells and then actually like sleeping with them, and kind of thinking more about the future and what will be probably possible not too long from now, and it's actually things that might be enabled by research going on here. Like there's somebody, Amanda Clark, who's trying to make germ cells from normal adult cells and help people with infertility problems and. I just, yeah, I'm curious if uh, you've had conversations about that. Do you have any thoughts on those? I, I mean, I think that that is also a possibility. So there's the possibility to clone someone, and there's the possibility to kind of uh, reproduce with them potentially, and, and, and so forth. So those things are, are kind of not spelled out, but are definitely uh, latently there. So Soraya just said, there's always two sides of the coin, and I absolutely agree, but I think it's important to have these kind of dialogues. I'm passionate about that, uh, and I'm very happy to see uh, North-South Campus, you're actually bringing in this, kind of, this discourse that I try to encourage here very much. So to me, uh, having a a movie, an art form, whatever shape it takes, 
that generates these debates and dialogues is really what's super important because ultimately it's about awareness and choice and knowing which way the coin goes and sometimes the balance gets on one side or the other. Uh, and in this age of consumerism, I think it's important to be aware of what's going on. We just don't know. So whatever it takes to create this dialogue. And then, of course, Soraya is in between in the humanities. So we have you covered. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Friday night, how wonderful to have you here as this great audience and whoever's out there, thank you too. And uh, sign up for both Fathomers and Artsai mailing lists. We're going to keep working together. Thank you for uh, Stacy and Lacey for doing an amazing job to pull together these many myriad points of view to have this discussion. I think it's super important and wonderful. And um, enjoy your weekend, hopefully. Thank you.